It is my great pleasure today to chair this event, the, the book launch of uh, Embattled Dreamland, the politics of uh, contesting Armenian, Tur Kurdish and Turkish uh, memory, written by David and published this year by Rutledge, namely this book. David uh, is a research fellow at Temo and in uh, 2018 and 19 was a Manu uh, Manugian uh, postdoctoral fellow in the University of Michigan, Department of Sociology. He holds a doctoral degree from Humboldt University to Berlin. And his uh, current research project is entitled Relict of Another, pa Another Future, sorry. Uh, the project examines uh, how materialities and vision of uh, future urbanization shapes society's life of the present in uh, Central Asian and uh, Southern Caucasus. But before uh, being thrown to the future, let's go back to the past, uh, namely the, past, the violent past that uh, is uh, uh, narrating in his own uh, monograph. And indeed, I leave the floor to you, David. Uh, to tell us a bit about the making of the of this book and its content, uh, please uh, welcome. Uh, join me to welcome him, and uh, the floor is yours, David. Thanks. Thanks so much, Veronica, for this kind introduction. Now I'm gonna take you to my presentation. Um, by the way, I'm not sure whether I should be happy or sad that this is a Zoom meeting because I know that the majority of you would not be able to be in Berlin to join. Uh, and also I have the possibility to hide away from such a huge audience right now in my room, so I kind of enjoy that, I think. So um, let me share my screen with you. Here we go. Yes, um, it's visible, right, Veronica? Yeah? Yes. Perfect, okay. So um, in kind of um, around 20, 25 minutes, I will try to provide you with some glimpse into my book here. I will kind of provide you more of an overview of the different chapters and the specific aspects that can be interesting. Whereas we will have then a discussion also later on that allows us to explore specific, more detailed aspects and its relevance also in the light of the current uh, aftermath of war in our uh, upcoming discussion. The book starts actually with something that we could call more of an historical um, reconstruction. Tur uh, coined the uh, saving the empire, killing its subjects, Armenian and Circassian tales. So to some of them, it might raise the question, why Circassian tales? Well, um, the chapter is basically um, an attempt of rooting the Armenian genocide in the wider context of ethnic cleansing. And here I specifically look at how the Ottoman empire also borrows technologies of ethnic cleansing, so to say, from um, the um, deportation of Northern Caucasians to the Ottoman Empire. I, this is kind of one level. And I also look at how then the genocide again unfolds in uh, further uh, violence in the, in the period to come. So it's a kind of attempt of, on the one hand, reconstructing the event in historical terms, also by drawing from uh, Ottoman and mainly also German archival resource, we can talk there more about in detail. And, but what I tried to show is also how there is a certain, um, we could call destructive learning process where empires that are uh, turning into nation states adopt a certain uh, rationale of ethnic cleansing geared towards homogenizing their own empires. And um, based on this, um, again, this is more of the historical um, reconstruction of my book that kind of paves the way for our further discussion on what will be at the heart of the book that is memory politics. I talk about the uh, Armenian, Turkish and Kurdish national movement that is the movements towards constructing an imaginary Eastern Turkey, Western Armenia or Northern Kurdistan in comparative perspective. And again, here for me, it was very important to strike, um, um, to hint at the similarities at both the historical overlappings that is, for example, in the case of the rapprochement between the Young Turks and the Dashnak Tsitsun, the short-lived, or also the overlapping between the Kurdish national movement and um, the Armenian um, during the Soviet period. So there are different elements that I specifically want to hint at. And I, the main aim of this chapter, again, is to not take, of course, the uh, emergence of those three nationalisms for granted, but to root them in a specific historical and geographical context 
and to understand them and that will form the kind of uh, overall framework for the chapters to come as mirror images of each other. So I'm interested in how they condition each other and how the nationalism also do not emerge in a political vacuum, but how they emerge as mirror images, distorted mirror images of each other, how the emergence of um, national movement in the case of the Armenians conditions the way how uh, Turks frame themselves as a nation and how also the emergence of a Turkish nation state then leads to the way how Kurds positions them in return again against the, um, the Turkish nation state. So here I'm very interested in like unveiling specifically these uh, intertwined and overlapping dimensions of nationalism. This is, forms more of a kind of, let's say the historical section of my book and um, based, and here we see like um, also illustrations that I created for the book that is of the imaginary homeland, something that I will return back and we will also deepen more in the discussion. Here we see what is imagined as a Western Armenia that's largely based here on the Wilsonian plan of Aramitian Hayastan of a Western Armenia. And uh, here in contrast, we see that of a Bakura Kurdistan, you know, the, the, the idea of a Kurdistan divided in four, and this is the, referred to as the Northern Kurdistan, whereas the other three parts are referred to Kurdish populated areas in Iraq, Syria, and Iran. And here we see also um, based on this, and the, area that it co that forms the shadow zone where both these national um, territory these imagined national territories collide and that is the contested geography you see here which is at the heart of my own reach it's here we see the lake lake van that is the area where an uh, imagined armenia that is the retrotopia the historical image of an of an uh, western armenia is colliding on turkish territory with the image, the future-oriented image, the utopia of an in independent Kurdistan. And this is exactly the contested area that I look at, which is at the heart of my book in the fieldwork. But before we go to this point, I want to um, outline in this uh, chapter that I frame mirrored narratives. You see, I'm referring back to what I was saying about how national narratives condition each other. So here, this chapter provides, first of all, a kind of macro level view, although I'm not very happy with the word macro level, that is what we would see, uh, think of more like as the official, the political narrative of history, both in the Kurdish and Armenian Turkish context. Of course, while we have in the sovereign nation states in the Armenian and Turkish case, the Kurdish case is a bit more tricky one. So I wasn't sure what specific sources to take into regard. And as I was dealing specifically with the Kurdish area in, um, in Turkey, I opted specifically for looking at sources um, disseminated directly by the party Kagerane Kurdistan, that is the PKK, or um, institutions closely affiliated with them. And here I propose um, a fourfold typology that allows us to better understand the way how national narratives are crafted. The main uh, point of departure for this chapter here is that national narratives are not self-evident. And the way they unfold, they need to be sustained uh, constantly uh, through political, uh, high political resources. And in order to sustain those national narratives that then might appear evident, that might appear self-evident to some of those socialized into those narratives, I um, draw from a fourfold typology that I developed uh, drawing from other scholars such as uh, Benjamin, um, such as Faulkner, Mary Douglas, Sevani Shanyan, and uh, also um, Fritz Münkler. And here the first um, uh, aspect we see is that of narrating. Well, narrating is pretty much the, the act of narrating the national narrative. And here I link it very strongly to uh, the works of um, Bernhard Faulkner in his book, um, uh, Learning from the Past, Lessons from the Past, that is, um, he develops there based on Fry's typology, an idea of the national narrative as a national melodrama. And I think that's kind of very useful here. At this point, I look at the stories that frame the national um, uh, pathway and demarcate it along the line of a um, dichotomy of, of course, a good an, an uh, elevated inner group and an other, otherwise demonized outer group. 
But here, in order to kind of root this more into an empirical research, I look at specific history textbooks with regard to the Armenian case. You see Hayot's Bat Motsun, Armenian history textbook 11, that deals with the Armenian genocide. And we have uh, the Turkish history textbook also from 11th grade, the long hit century and Uzun uh, Yuzil that deals equally with the period of 1915. And ultimately in the absence of a uh, Kurdish textbook available in Turkey, I look at uh, Abdul Öcalan's works, specifically uh, uh, his oeuvre of five books uh, of the Uygalic Democ the Democratic Uygalic Manifesto, so that is the Civilization Democratic Manifesto. Uh, here, with regard to Armenia, with regard to all three cases, I'm interested in what we could call the meta narratives, to speak with the words of Lutin, and uh, I'm here specifically interested in what is the story a story of, right, and how it links to others uh, other national stories. And here, with regard to Armenia, I see very uh, strong overlappings with what the Norwegian historian calls the calls the Christian border guard myth, something that I uh, borrowed from a discussion of. Um, of Toda Kulic that is here. Uh, you see a Serbian um, sociologist who worked on memory studies in the Yugoslavian context. And here we have a historical, in this kind of the light motive of this narrative is a historically rooted enmity between a Christian nation, which is surrounded by threatening Islamic forces. That is something that we see not only in the MENA narrative, we see this equally in Serbian history textbooks. We see this in Greek history textbooks, and we see that, um, most illustratively even in Bulgarian history textbooks. We see the kind of aim also, but because I'm always interested what's also the kind of political aim of these narratives. It is the kind of emancipation of relatively young nation states from the cultural legacy of the Ottoman or in the case of Armenia, also the Persian empire. And we see this with regard to specific uh, elements that, that show up constantly here. For example, one is that of the Odarkia at Samarlot, that is the heavy yoke of the foreigner and also what is important here is the idea of the restoration of na nationhood. It's not about the creation of nationhood at the time of the national movement, but it's about Heike Kahn, Peter, Peter Ganutsune, Vera Ganknil. That is the restoration, that is the idea always of restoring a uh, primordially existing national homeland. And when we go uh, to the Ottoman side, here we see more of the uh, classical imperial narrative. That is something that I would call the Ottoman light culture. Here we see Turks appear as the rulers of empires that, uh, with, re uh, with regard also to Devlet de Rum and the Ottoman Empire who were here betrayed in times of existential crisis. So it evokes a certain step in the back myth and Deutschstuss Legende. Uh, here again, the political aim we see is creating a line of continuity from imperial rule of the Seljuks over Ottoman statehood to present day Turkey. Again, a narrative that we can see on a meta level to be very similar, for example, to the narrative we have nowadays in history textbooks in Russia on the Tsarist Russian history. And here, what is what interesting with regard to the Ninja set, we see a full reversion of the historical event. So um, the 1915 is picked up, but interestingly, 1915 is uh, uh, turned upside down. And here we have a, a direct quote from the history textbook at the question, which here, uh, the English translation, during the forced resettlement approximately um, 10,000 people died as a result of bandit attacks and about 30,000 lost their lives due to respiratory diseases. Well, that's the respiratory diseases you normally have when you are actually drawn into the desert of Syria as uh, this book also engages with the historical textbook of Ron Sunni. But according to the number of neutral researchers, a total of 300,000 Armenians died during the war and rebellions. In contrast to this, Armenians killed, actually massacred, Katle Tilde, uh, around 600,000 Turks and forced 500,000 to migrate. So it's interesting that the Turkish book not only um, provides an apologetic narrative for the genocide, but it turns it de facto upside down. Uh, but I think far more interesting than maybe the, both the national narrative in the Armenian case and the Turkish case, is that uh, the narrative we have in Kurdish publication, publications close to the de facto Kurdish in, uh, state institutions. And here we have um, the, as a leitmotiv, the violent clashes between people and the oppression of the Kurdish people due to a higher force. So here we see an externalization, which is also framed as an abstract force, that of capitalist modernity, capitalist modernity. And what is, I think, important when we here look again to the aims, similar to other narratives we can find also in the case of post-colonial states, it's the explanation of Kurdish statelessness also. 
And it's, of course, also justification of a continuing armed resistance, which is very different from the Armenian and the Turkish case to a certain extent, where we have already the monopoly of violence established at the hand of the states. And however, and we come back here at the point of silencing, it also aids to a relativization of responsibility because Kurds become subcontractors of the genocide, no longer agents of the genocide. And I think an example here that um, summarizes this ideas in a nutshell is also from this work I'm quoting. Görünüşü Bible savaşan tüm bu haklar üzerinde tekelci kapitalizm iktidar ve sömürüsün kurbanlarıydı. So uh, all those nations seemingly fighting each other were in fact victim to the same monopolistic regime of capitalism and its exploitation. I think this kind of externalization that is at the heart of this of the narrative that I call a narrative of a force majeure, a major an, an outside force, is well well summarized, I think, in this quote. Coming here also just to very briefly uh, deal with this, I, I was looking here drawing from researchers like Mary Douglas, who's talking about the institutional forgetting. In this uh, aspect of the chapter, I look more at uh, the kind of dark spots of history. So I look at the Turkey, how Turkey is framed as a nation of Muhajirs. And um, also we see here, um, in the case of, uh, wait, ah, yeah. in the case of Armenia, of course, the kind of ele big elephant in the room is the legacy of Muslims. That is the Muslim legacy in today's Armenia. Here we see in the background um, um, an old graveyard, an abandoned graveyard that was abandoned during the outbreak of the first Karabakh war, something that we will surely return back in our uh, final discussion. And uh, with regard to Kurds, I specifically look at the silencing of Kurdish complicity in the genocide. So I look at how Kurdish, uh, the Kurdish role and also the fact that Kurds did benefit also in the genocide is externalized and is largely blamed on the Turkish state in, in a kind of simplification that allows Kurds to, in some sense, um, recognize the Armenian genocide, however, without bearing the blunt of responsibility for it. So these are kind of different aspects that I, I, the reason why I talk about them is I want to show what are the stories that are left out of the story, because I argue that the silencing is as important as narrating in underpinning the national narrative. And from this, I move on to performing. Performing, um, I think we have a couple of minutes I just want to show. Uh, I was looking largely at the uh, ceremonializations of the Armenian genocide, but, uh, and in Turkey also at what we would call a blocking myth that is the kind of countermeasures and here specifically we see uh, performances geared towards mourning the um, battle of Sadekamish. And um, this was in some sense used as a blocking myth in order to, to kind of overshadow uh, potential protests that would um, bring to the front the crimes of the Armenian genocide with a kind of counter narrative. But with regard to Armenia, of course, we have a commemoration of the Armenian genocide. What I saw, however, interesting here is, I, unlike the first chapter that reconstructs the Armenian national, uh, the Armenian genocide, however, outside what I would frame as the Armenian national narrative, here we see how the Armenian genocide is used within the framing of the Armenian national narrative. And we can have here just a couple of seconds from a song from Sirusha. Can you hear it actually? Ah, you cannot hear that, wait. Then um, I'll try to start sharing again. Ah yeah, share computer sound. Now you will. Without the music, it is far less. Than... So um, to know um, this song is um, not, a, it's a modern adaption of an old song by the Dash Institution that is the Armenian national group and that uh, commemorates the song in some sense celebrates the death of Talat Pasha who was uh, one of the leading architects of the Minen genocide, who was killed by Soko Montehlerian on Hardenbergstraße in Berlin. And this song is, what's interesting is, however, that this song that is uh, within the context of the post, I mean, the aftermath of the Minen genocide is here taken in the aftermath of the April war in 2016. That is, uh, and the singer herself is also politically affiliated. She is the uh, wife of the son of then, of former president Lever. Um, uh, Kocharian, so part of the Karabakh uh, group. <laughs>
So what's a, uh, I will, I think I, there's far more to see in here, but I think we move on. However, what's important here, you see, we start off from this kind of historical remake. However, then we end up with Kalashnikovs and the Kalashnikovs are undoubtedly a symbol of the ongoing Karabakh war and not of um, uh, 1915 or the nemesis operations geared towards um, the extermination or the killing of uh, the assassination of um, polit Turkish politicians involved in the mini genocide. So I think that's, and I was specifically in this chapter looking at how is the past brought into the present and how is the past also employed in order to justify certain politics. In the present, I looked at this both with regard to the Turkish case, the Kurdish case, and the Armenian case. Lastly, also to just very briefly look at this aspect here, I look at mapping. Mapping, I specifically um, draw also from the concept of Herfried Münkler and this idea of the monumentalization of the landscape. And here um, at the heart of this chapter is specifically the renaming of landscapes. And here we have, for example, a document from the Turkish state from the 1950s, in which we have the official renaming of former Assyrian, former Armenian, and also Kurdish villages to Turkish. So we here see here a massive, so to say, toponomical Turkification of the landscape, something that to a certain extent we can see also in the Caucasus with regard to Armenia. Here, for example, uh, just to uh, single out some, Betkar, for example, former Assyrian village renamed to Jevizdibe. Then we see um, village names of, of from Armenian origin, like Pianis, for example, or uh, also um, I think um, a good example is also Geramus, renamed to Uchiol. Pianist, rent to avatars. And these documents help, uh, based also on these historical documents, I'm showing how the new national maps are created. So how, uh, how the new, the national narrative that we see was formed both through acts of silencing and act of narrating is then ultimately inscribed into the landscape. Then um, we move here basically to, that is the kind of like um, breaking point. This was more of a reconstruction of the different national narratives of comparative perspective. And here we see already, for those uh, familiar with the paintings of Elisitsky, you know, this is visual plagiarism. That is, of course, his um, uh, the red wedge that beats the whites. Here, the, the image you can see here. So here we move towards what I would call the subversive narratives. And here we go to the Van region, which I was already um, pointing out at the beginning, lies at the heart of my research. Uh, we see here, by the way, in the background also, this is the abandoned um, uh, historical site where, like, where the old Van city was um, located above the Van castle. And here what's important is that I look at the local space, I turn to local space, and I look at the local space as I'm in a monoid frontier. What do I mean with it? I mean with it that I look at the aspects of the local space that favors the emergence, the perseverance of, L of counter narratives. So I, here I specifically look at how counter narratives are ingrained in both the local um, forms of storytelling. I look specifically here with regard to Kurtz, to the uh, to Deng Bez uh, and Chirug Bez. And uh, I also look at um, the way how people interact with the ruins of the, of the disappeared people. So I look at how they do interact with Armenian cross stones, with the leftovers of Armenian churches, what kind of counter narrative this um, triggers. I look at the persistence of old uh, toponymy. So here when you, for example, the interesting thing is that the majority of people who live in the villages here in Hakari, when we take Ilivin, they, they would still refer to their villages by the old names that have been uh, actually not in place since almost a hundred years. So like they would still refer to the villages as Batkar or Bilov or Kaval. And so I see there is also this kind of like ingrained practices of everyday resistance we could call. But at the same time, I also look at the local uh, landscape as an alien homeland that is, um, it is neither a fully, um, it has neither become a fully homeland of the present day population, nor is it in the homeland of, the, of the descendants of those who have been expelled. For those who are currently living, they are living in a, new, in a, in a newly minted homeland cluttered with the landscape, with, with the ruins and the materiality of a disappeared uh, and removed people. And that applies not only to Armenians, but also to Assyrians and Yezidis. And on the other hand, for those who travel to the region, they wake up to the realization that what they had imagined, what they had cherished as a lost homeland of a hundred years ago has become now the everyday today reality of, la of a largely Kurdish population today living there. So we see on both sides that this uh, return and this framing of, a, of one's national home is something that remains inevitably incomplete and fragmentary on both sides. 
And uh, ultimately, I, uh, what lies at the heart of my, my work, that is the entwined narratives. So we re remember that we discussed about the mirrored narratives on the national level, but here on the level of the entwined narratives, I look at specific local narratives of both Armenians, the descendants of Armenians, Assyrians and Yazidis nowadays living in the Caucasus who were expelled from the Van region and the residents largely the um, Sunni Kurds, but also Alevis and to a lesser extent also Turks living in the region of Lake Van. And here I, want, I show, and that is actually one of, uh, of the core aspects of my research. I show that we tend to always reiterate ideas such as Armenian collective memory, Turkish national memory. We see this proliferatively in used in newspapers when they say Armenians remember, Kurds remember, Germans remember. But I, I dissect this and argue actually that there is no national collective memory as the only overlapping and the only overarching framework that conditions memory. But there are, it's a multitude of different aspects, um, factors that condition memory. And, and I look here for specifically on, uh, uh, on the role of being local and newcomer. So I look at how do uh, residents remember whose descendants lived in the region before the Armenian genocide? Who do those, who, how do those relate to the history who were resettled maybe, who were maybe themselves also expelled, such as for example, uh, Muhaji Kurds, which were uprooted from the Caucasus and then resettled to the region. How do the young and how do the old remember? What is the generational tension between uh, Kurds socialized in the 1516s and um, Kurds socialized in our generation? And also um, how is this become specifically uh, interesting in the meaning context where we have also a change of a memory regime where we have generations socialized in the Soviet period where living together with Muslims, with Azerbaijanis, Kurds was an everyday um, experience. Whereas we have now new generations to whom this past is an utterly um, alien past. And there have been only very recently great um, actually uh, endeavors in the last year to bring back this uh, Soviet uh, Armenian Azerbaijani past. Also, this book is really interesting from uh, Lucy Karatsian, Asikot Mahabrabian, Fragments of Armenia's Soviet Past. So this is a past that I also retraced through looking at the different generational uh, aspects. And then of course, I look also at um, the role ideology plays. So I, um, rather than, uh, than taking the idea of a collective Armenian, Kurdish and Turkish memory for granted, I look at the different subgroups. How does Kurdish communist remember? How does the Kurdish supporter of the Hezbollah remember? How does Armenian um, nationalist remember? How does an, um, uh, an Armenian um, anarchist remember? How does someone rem uh, remembers that frames himself as apolitical? So I want to look at the different subgroups and it's kind of like uh, overlapping narratives across the national divide. For this, um, and um, I'm seeing how much, uh, oh, I don't know, that happens when you just want to check how much time you have. Um, so I'm just, I think, uh, coming also slowly to the end. Um, so, okay. And for this um, endeavor, I uh, long term field work was conducted in both Armenia and Turkey. I'm sure we will have more possibilities also to talk about this in the ensuing uh, discussion. Within this framework, I visited different regions of Armenia, mainly regions with higher populations of descendants, that is, regions where. Armenians and Yazidis that, uh, whose uh, descendants were expelled from the region of Lake Van are currently living. And this, uh, I was largely able to retrace specific rural communities in, uh, in, Araka, in the province of Arakat, Sotan, Armavir, Kotaik, and then of course also in the urban realm of Yerevan, that is the capital of Armenia. With regard to Turkey, I was conducting my field work in what is now divided into four administrative zones that largely correspond to the Bitlis and Van Vilayet. That is nowadays the Bitlis, uh, Il, Hakari, Mush and Van. Although Hakari has not been at the center of my work, I then deci uh, decided uh, against including my research I was conducting in Hakari. And um, here just in kind of to come to an end, I'm just providing some visual snapshots. This is from a very close companion of mine with whom my field work in the Kurdish region would have been largely impossible, I would say, simply because I wouldn't have been able to move mobilely to some of the areas where I conducted my fieldwork. This picture from our right 
two areas around Gever that's known in Yuxik, as Yüksekova in Turkey, here in Orama along the Iraqi border. And that is uh, the clat cluttered ruins in at the site of old uh, Ban, that is where the old city has been uh, located. Interestingly, the, the new city has been not built on the ruins of the old city. The new city is now more uh, towards a farther away from the lake. And the old city is still a um, field of debris, a field of ruins at the heart of Lake Van. Here we see we are inside the Varaka Van, an Armenian um, church, also a monastery complex, actually. And here we see also what was made it very interesting was that the fieldwork was conducted in the year 2015 when the Turkish elections was going on. Uh, although we see here, this is in front of the office of the Kurdish party. Although this one is not a banner for elections, but this is celebrating in Kurdish the day of um, the Kurdish language, Jaina Zamane Kurdi Pirozbe. And, uh, but it was interesting because just um, a couple of weeks actually after my, I completed my research, we would witness again the breakout of um, massive fighting between the Turkish military and Kurdish paramilitaries in this region. So the research was conducted actually within a very short time window that no one was able to predict at that point. And um, uh, here we move to Yerevan is, yes, you see this, this both from spring. And of course, equally here, I didn't have my great uh, uh, travel companion Akun. So here I was largely going with uh, Mashrutkas, that is the white minibuses you are familiar with if you had ever been to any uh, post-socialist, specifically post-Soviet country and also can in beyond. Uh, here's from Tallinn province. And here also, interestingly, these are also maps. These are historically reconstructed maps of the lost homeland, which I found very interesting. So these, so for every each and every uh, district of what Armenians frame as Western Armenia in nowadays Turkey, you have uh, specifically uh, detailed uh, reconstructed maps of the villages. We see here uh, also um, interview conducted with different uh, local informants in the village of Katnachbjur, which had been formerly known by the um, uh, name of Mehriban, has been re a village renamed equally to most of the villages renamed on the side of Turkey. Here we are in a museum. I cannot exactly remember the village, but it's uh, in the Arakatsotan province, uh, devoted to the um, Fedais, that is the Armenian resistance fighters, uh, such as Serhat Pasha, we, who we see here in the background. Here also, interestingly, a graveyard located also in the vicinity of Katnachbjur, where some of the Armenian fighters that were active in the struggle against Ottoman authorities uh, during the time of World War I were also buried. So with, with the inscriptions of their uh, native home uh, towns, also in, um, with interesting ornamentations. And um, the interesting thing is that the book was supposed, and I just realized this actually a couple of days ago, somehow I subconsciously and had my book ending exactly in the year of 1988, which is the year I was born. But the reason why it ended in 1988 is because it was the breakout of the nagorno karabakh war, which I think none of you was able to uh, um, not hear about over the last months, I think. And what I found here interesting, and that's what I look at in my final chapter, of course, not knowing that this year would see the largest fight outbreak of fighting in an actual full-scale war since the truce, since the ceasefire in 1994, was uh, I was discussing it with regard to the linkages between the Armenian genocide and its and this potential of mobilization with regard to the first Karabakh war. And here we have interesting snapshots that illustrate this. Here we see uh, 1915 referring to the Armenian genocide, 1918, 1920 refers to pogroms uh, perpetrated by Muslim populations uh, against Armenians. And 1988 refers to the year of where the photo was taken, that is the year of, uh, of the Karabakh, uh, emergence of the Karabakh war. And here it says, Ova Mechavor, who is to blame? So we see how the events of 1915 are here plotted in a, a lo longer overarching narrative in a, that creates a long, this kind of long history, long durée that, that, that shows the current present of the past, that is the present of 1988 through the prism of 1915. 
And we see this even more uh, clearly with regard to the aftermath of the pogroms in Sungait, that is the massacre of Armenian civilians in an industrial town close to Baku, which also followed uh, large-scale protests. This was already within the, in the light of the um, escalating Karabakh conflict that would turn into a full-scale war in the years to come. And here it's also interesting, and this will be one of the last slides to end, we see here in Russian, it's a commemoration, obviously, from for the uh, victims of Sumgait. So we demand the truth about Sumgait. And interesting here, we moved a bit below to the Armenian. It here says, Pahanjek war Soviet Gan Social Sagan Han Repetition Remutsun, Karavarutsune, Induni, and Tsehaspansun. So, and here in Armenian, it says, we demand that the Soviet authorities recognize the 1915 um, genocide. So I think this is, and this is literally like uh, next to each other as we see. So we see uh, the intertwining, how again, uh, the past and the irreconciled side um, and traumatic experience of the past always come back to the present and how they don't find rest. And uh, I have my own argumentation in the book why this is the case, which I only briefly will um, elaborate here. But I'm arguing that specifically what is uh, lacking is what I would call as an overarching, as a um, transcending narrative of resistance in which, for example, um, the Turkish uh, governors, governors, Ottoman governors that resisted the deportations could then come up so, uh, suddenly in a historical narrative where they are uh, side by side with Armenians that resisted the, uh, the deportation themselves or Armenians that were killed. So I think that there is um, uh, a lot of um, different elements. There are a lot of personal biographies actually that would allow us to bridge across these ethno-national divides between that of uh, what we frame commonly as a Turkish perpetrator and Armenian um, collective victim. However, I think these narratives have not been sufficiently explored on either of the side. And I think specifically in this regard, the Kurdish uh, dimension is uh, in, of particular relevance because with the Kurdish dimension, we see an, a total hybrid uh, case. We see Kur Kurds playing a crucial role in the massacres of 1915. However, we see equally Kurds at the hand of repressive policies, specifically during the 90s insurgency, that is the civil uh, war that we witnessed in Turkey between the Turkish state and Kurdish paramilitia around the PKK, and which we see also in their ongoing escalations, uh, re-escalation specifically after 19, uh, after sorry, after 2015. Ultimately, coming to the absolute present, that is the present that transcends the book because the book was printed in uh, May this year. We see here again how the narrative of the genocide is brought up now in what has been already uh, after the ceasefire was declared that was close to an Armenian capitulation. Again, uh, posters here we see um, the flag of the independent uh, de facto um, uh, independent state of Artsakh, that is how it uh, Karabakh is referred to in the Armenian context. And we see here the clear indications speak, about, uh, speak up to prevent another genocide, referring to uh, Azerbaijani war crimes to the, and uh, the bombing of civilians within the framework of this war. We see this also coming up very uh, inf uh, influsionary um, and very proliferant and different protests across both within Armenia and here, as we see in Connecticut, so in the, di the diaspora. Here again, also uh, next to the claim, um, support Armenia first Christian country, prevent second Armenian genocide. So we see that again, the past that remains irreconciled continues to re-enter the historical stage. However, it is framed and it serves different political um, goals. Um, similarly, we see also how um, within the Turkish context here, I like the, um, the image, but we see also how um, the Armenian genocide links there to the assassination of Van Dink, a famous Armenian uh, Turkish um, Istanbulite journalist. And you know, there in the, in, in the Turkish case, however, we see stronger how the Armenian genocide is linked to continuation of structural violence within Turkey. So how we see how, uh, for example, people that feel themselves to be marginalized by the current Turkish state uh, often tend 
to appropriate in some sense and to internalize this uh, narrative of the Armenian genocide and link it to what they experience as their own repression within uh, current Turkey. So we see also uh, at these two examples alone, how the way, even though the historical event is the same, the way it is framed, even among groups that affirm the, the, the existence of the event can differ strongly depending on the historical context. And here I'm coming to the end and uh, I'm giving the word back to Veronica and then we will have also a chance to open up the floor for questions and discussions. Thank you so much, David, uh, David for uh, this introduction and uh, to go uh, with such a depth with, uh, into the content of, of, uh, of the book. And I've, I found it very uh, fascinating uh, the, how the intricacies of these uh, of this different uh, historical events reverberate a lot into the present and into different geographies. You know, you started with the expulsions of uh, Circassians in uh, Zarist Russia, and we see also now that, you know, you have many Circassians in uh, Lebanon, Syria, and uh, you mentioned uh, Armenian diaspora and so on. I will not go into details, <laughs> not to repeat yourself, but your work really made me think about a lot about also the, the concept of victimhood that you implies and uh, that you use also in uh, in your work. So, so you kind of did, you know. But while I was reading uh, the book and uh, and I found it very fascinated uh, how we have different competing understanding of what violence creates, what violence generates, and here. You pointed out to ethno-nationalism, but it's also about other type of stories as you uh, highlight during the presentation. And in a certain way, also this violence is used and these experiences of oppressions are used to make claims and to justify even other acts of violence. So as, uh, again, here we have a certain of circularities of uh, being a victim and, and also violence itself uh, that regenerate in, uh, in a continuum. And in a way, your concept, uh, what, what you describe is also very different from, uh, from an idea of uh, victimhood that is very common nowadays and thinking about the victim as a passive and especially as an innocent subject. And, uh, and I think that your book really dwelt very well into, into this aspect, complicating this just the image uh, of, uh, of what does it mean also to, to be subjected to violence, but also to perpetrate violence, complicating a bit this dichotomy. And so I was wondering also, what is the, your own concept of, of what does it mean to be a victim, especially in, in relation to your work? And our, uh, talking about victimhood also, you pointed out to this uh, the tension or the relations between the land and, and the people. And this is, has been uh, something that I think uh, one of the dilemma we will all have in our uh, life or, uh, in academia, I guess, or not just academia. So here with the land, the one region especially is renamed, remapped and reshaped by political violence, but also group experiences of this land and different claims and this intersect with ethno-nationalism. And actually before reading your book, I was very intrigued by the use of uh, dreamlands. Uh, you, so you use land in plural, although it's the same land and uh, uh, I also you add uh, uh, the word dreams that usually in anthropology is a lot used for uh, indicating aspirations and futurity but your book is actually about a, a politics of memory so so I was just uh, curious about uh, this choice and and because also I think that this history, they are very powerful in saying that there is not a, poli you know, this, this violence also cannot produce a politics of otherwise. So as also you said now in your presentation, this, the, the biographies of, of people that uh, discern from ethno-nationalism is also not producing uh, an alternative in a way. So they, maybe there are inchoate narrative of talking about the otherwise, what can happen outside of that frame, but we still see that is something uh, not very much there. So I, I stop here to use my, the privilege, my privilege as chair and uh, I leave the word to you and then I open the, the floor. Thanks. Yeah, really thanks a lot, Verica, for your really thought provoking uh, questions. Um, trying to address your questions. Um, 
Yeah, I think with uh, victimhood is something that is uh, not an operative concept in my book, but it's something that in some sense permeates all each and every aspect of the book still. And um, I think that uh, without um, here maybe saying something very new, I think that there's always this idea of um, of victimhood as a vicious circle, right? Where the victimhood of one is used in order to justify the violence against the other that in return against uh, brings back violence. A good example, I think, is also the role how the I mean, genocide was truly, uh, was certainly employed in the 1980s, beginning of the 90s in the first Karabakh war in order to also uh, justify a more um, nationalistic stance towards the solution of the question and also in order to uh, undermine credibly, credibly, seemingly credibly, the idea that coexistence with the other. However, we see, and this is interesting, thing, this continuation, right, where nowadays uh, the, ex, the extortion, the, the ethnic cleansing, the uh, expulsion of Armenians, the destructions of Armenian historical um, uh, heritage is justified also on the Azerbaijani side as a way of uh, redemption that is redemption through revenge, I think I would call it. And uh, I would say that this is always leading to kind of apologetic narrative, a narrative that serves the purpose of justifying violence that serves um, the status quo of the uh, nation state. However, I think that there is also this kind of, I do believe, otherwise I think I would have been not able to do this work for so many years, that there is the possibility of what I would call something like a redemption or resolution through solidarity. That is to understand the victim, the legitimate also um, claim to victimhood by the other which is a very painful process, especially a process that is more difficult to uh, uh, ascertain if it is um, interrupted by bombs, military warfare. But I still firmly believe that this is the only way out. And I think that uh, this rings basically the words of a famous like person saying this is like, uh, the blood cannot be washed by blood, like So I, I think to kind of come to answer briefly to this first question, I, I, I would say that this is really at the heart. And I think there have been also many um, progress made, both within the context of Turkey and within the, within the context of Armenia. With, again, with regard to Turkey, for example, I think of events such as uh, organizations such as AKB, for example, like a left-wing oriented organization here also based in Berlin that were organizing talks uh, which brought together Kurdish, Turkish, Armenian intellectuals discussing 1915, discussing the impact also of the violence. And I think also of projects like um, that were conducted under the auspices uh, of uh, organizations like DVB International with scholars such as Lusni Khalatsan that were, uh, and Leila Nesi that were trying to bring back the polyvocality of local history and it was youth projects, you know. So I, I, I do believe that this question can be raised theoretically, but it can be answered maybe only through action in some sense. And uh, regarding the second thing, um, also very uh, interesting question, but um, yeah, I was for a long time actually thinking about using something like the memory and battle memory scapes. But uh, I more and more realized that the longer I was working on the topic, the more I got interested in the, 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 the threefold relationship between past, present, and future. So because the, the kind of paradox of memory or of like historical experience seems to be that there is a certain historical experience that is piled up as Walter Benjamin says, but then it leaves us with this kind of like uh, debris. And in this field of debris, we of course craft our own narrative of the past. However, this narrative of the past then becomes something that conditions our opportunities, our possibilities in the present, and by this, predetermines our future, but it doesn't predetermine our future because the past is predetermining our future. Otherwise we would be fully living in a deterministic world, but our ideas of the past is determining our future. And that's why I was uh, referring to this with regard to dreamlands and embattled, of course, very obviously, because I look at what I showed in the maps at specifically the geographical nexus where the three uh, national imaginaries that is the actually, um, officially existing Eastern Turkey collides with the red utopia of Western Armenia, Armatian Haistan and the utopia of uh, future Kurdistan. So I'm um, stop here also so that we will have more chance for, um, yes. for opening the floor and taking more questions. Thanks, David.